Did you get caught out doing something that you perhaps knew that you shouldn't be doing? I, for one, remember, and I'll never forget, the first time I got caught speeding. I was a, was a 18, a young fellow. Wasn't a boy racer, that wasn't me at all. Uh, I was just driving home from college, and uh, one thing about Northern Ireland is, when you pass your test for the first year, your maximum speeding uh, speed sorry, is 45 miles an hour. You're not allowed to go any faster than 45 miles an hour. And uh, so I was on my, on my way home in a bit of a rush, and uh, I was coming along the road, and sure enough, round the corner was this lovely policeman with his speed camera, and he caught me, and he waved me down and pulled me in. And I'll never forget the feeling of absolute dread of guilt, of shame. I mean, I was sat there in my car, I was sweating, it was ridiculous. But that feeling of being caught, up to that point, I didn't think there was anything wrong with what I was doing. But it was the moment I was caught that spurred those feelings of shame and guilt. And I was terrified to tell my parents when I got home. But thankfully, they were all very gracious about it. But the point I'm trying to make is, I want you to try and relate somewhat to this woman who was dragged out and publicly disparaged and embarrassed in front of everybody being caught doing something that was wrong. So if we can relate to her in that capacity, we can start to understand what Christ meant whenever he treated her in this way. So I've got a series of questions just for us to work through. And it will just be working through the text, just to hopefully help us understand it uh, as best as possible. So beginning there, we're told that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So location is everything. When we read the scriptures, one of the key questions that I always ask myself is, where is this taking place? Because location does matter. There's often significance with it. And one thing that we ought to know about the Mount of Olives it holds a great deal of significance. That's both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. Now, if you know anything of the Old Testament, King David, when he reigned, but whenever his son Absalom tried to overthrow him, King David um, retreated to the Mount of Olives. He went there for security. He went there for refuge. He went there for protection. So even from the Old Testament, we know that this place holds great significance. Now in the New Testament, the Mount of Olives, this is also the very place that Jesus Christ himself came to, to draw near to his Father. He came here to pray. Now you may in your own homes or in your own lives have somewhere that is special to you, that you go to pray, to feel closer to God. This was Mount of Olives for Christ. He came here to draw near to the Father. And he did that on several occasions. And that was including the night before his betrayal. When he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because the Garden of Gethsemane is at the base of the Mount of Olives. So this place is special. It's holy in some ways. And therefore it gives that more significance to what unfolded here in front of us. Now, I do want to just make mention that um, this piece of scripture, this part of a uh, text, is not included in the earliest Greek manuscripts. It was added to later. And you can have a theological debate about that later if you want to. But all in all, there is very little objection to this being here and the truth that is recorded for us here. So we have confidence that Although it wasn't included in the earliest manuscripts, this is the infallible, the perfect word of God. So that's the relevance of the location. In verse 2, we're told that as dawn appeared again in the temple courts, that's when Jesus went back. So he went back to the temple. And my question is, why was he returning? Why did he not just preach and move on? Because often he didn't stay long in one place. He did keep moving through his ministry. But why did he go back? Well, ultimately, the reason for going back was because he was fulfilling his ministry on earth. 
He was sharing the gospel with those around them and people were coming and listening. And I know that's what we pray for earnestly, that people would come and want to listen to the gospel. And that's what was happening here. Many people were coming and listening. And so Christ himself, was go- he would have kept going back to that temple as long as there were people to listen to what he would have to say. So many came to listen. It, he didn't just do it once. He kept doing it. It was repeated because there were those who were willing to hear what he would have to say. Now, if we had a breakdown of who those people were, there are many reasons as to why they would have come to hear Christ speak. Firstly, there's the first group who would have just been curious. It was new, it was different, they weren't sure what this was, so they wanted to go and listen to his teaching and hear what it is he had to say. Then there's the second group. Now they were more malicious. They were there because they wanted to mock him. They wanted to deride him. They wanted to humiliate him in some way and poke fun at the things that he was saying and trying to undo the things that he was saying. And then there's the third group, the ones with the genuine desire. It was placed in their hearts to come and listen to what Christ had to say because they wanted to know What did this man have to say when it came to salvation? We know what Moses said. We understand the law. But what does Jesus say? And so there was this third group that were genuine in their desire to be there. Now overall, that's our human understanding of why these people were here. Spiritually speaking, providentially speaking, he had to be there and he had to go back the next day in order to have this uh, encounter with this woman. So here we have a woman. She's pulled and thrown in front of Christ, in front of everybody in this temple. Many people had gathered here. And in amongst that, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, had found this woman and brought her in front of Christ. And my question is, how did they catch someone in the act of adultery? How do you actually catch someone in that act in order to drag them in front of somebody, in front of a whole crowd of people? And that has my follow-up question. Was this whole thing just a big setup? Was it just a trap? So this poor woman, she's dragged out, publicly humiliated in front of everybody. Now, the Pharisees aren't wrong in what they've done in the sense of the Pharisees had a responsibility to ensure that the law of Moses was being upheld. They were religious leaders. That was their job, to ensure that the law of Moses was being upheld. But as a result of that, they got a little bit high and mighty with that responsibility. They considered themselves to be judge and executioner over everyone. Anyone they deemed to have broken the law, they saw themselves as the people who ought to intervene and discipline. The circumstances under which this woman is found and brought before Jesus, there are questions to be asked. Now the sin of adultery itself, that's a private sin. It's not something that's done in public. I would certainly have been conducted behind closed doors and in secret. Therefore, how is it that the Pharisees knew to go and catch her in the act of something so secret and so private? And so my answer to this, it's merely speculation. I would wonder, had they set up a trap for this woman? Or had they known about her sin for a very long time and chose now, when Christ was present, to challenge her on it? Had they turned a blind eye up to this point? Were they just waiting for the right time to confront her? And why was it only her that was dragged out and not her male companion? He was also committing adultery. So why was it just her? Was there something against this woman? Did they have some revenge to take against her? We don't know, is the simple answer. But the fact remains that the Pharisees were malicious and had taken very deliberate action to catch her in the act. Whether it was a trap or not, they did this on purpose to catch this woman out. Now, if we read between the lines and we take into consideration the conversation that happens here, 
we can be confident that this whole event is a setup. But actually, it's more a setup to trap and ensnare Christ than it is this woman. This woman is collateral damage. She's just a means to an end. Their true purpose is to try and take down Christ, and this woman is a means by which they try to do that. There we have the next question. We have where they, they bring her before Christ, and they start to speak to Christ. And one of the first things they say is, teacher, teacher. Now that name is a mark of respect. To call him by teacher would suggest that they respect him. But my question is, did they? Did they respect him? Were they sincere in this? And I would say not. There's a strong indication that when they say teacher, this is out of mockery when they use this word. There's a sarcastic element to how they say this. It's basically saying, if you are who you really say you are, well, here's a problem. Here we have someone's broken the law of Moses and you're saying you're the Messiah. What are you going to do about it? It's all very much mockery and sarcasm. It's not a mark of respect to call him teacher. So I don't believe that they're sincere and I don't believe that they're respectful when they use that title. And if anything, it just highlights their desire to discredit him as a teacher. Because what they wanted to happen here was they wanted him to make a mistake. They wanted to acknowledge him as teacher, for him to make a mistake with this woman, and therefore everyone that looked upon this would realize that he is not the Messiah, he's to be ignored, and that they are to return to following the Pharisees and their teaching. That's what they wanted. So that's why they use this phrase, to try and discredit him and try to bring him down in front of everyone else. And there are also significant parallels with this phrase that they use, teacher, and the sign that was placed upon Jesus Christ's head on the cross when it said, King of the Jews. Again, that sign above Christ's head was not a mark of respect and acknowledgement. That was out of mockery. And that's what we have here as well. They wanted to publicly humiliate him. And they knew that with such large crowds around, they could do severe damage to Jesus Christ and his reputation and his ministry if he made a mistake and if he fell into their trap. That's what they wanted. So that phrase, teacher, that is not a mark of respect. That is them wanting to try to publicly humiliate Christ. So then, what do they hope to accomplish by asking the question, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? What did they want Jesus Christ to respond with? Now these were zealous religious leaders. They took their jobs very seriously and they thought very highly of themselves. And they were experts. We can't forget that. These men were experts in their knowledge of the law of Moses. Their knowledge was exceptional compared to many others. And they were right. They didn't make it up when they said that the law says those committed in, adul in adultery should be put to death. And just for re a reference, so you know that I'm not just making that up, Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 22. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. So they didn't make it up. They were right in what they said. But it was peculiar that they only brought the woman to be judged and not the man. So their knowledge was what they were using to try and test Christ. They knew what the law stated about adultery 
And therefore, that just gives further evidence to the fact that they knew full well what they were doing here. And that all of this event was just one big setup. A trap designed to ensnare Christ and discredit him. Ultimately, by asking him this question, they wanted him to out himself. They wanted him to not uphold the law of Moses. They really want him to be responsible for his own downfall. In the eyes of the public, they want to be seen to do the right thing and they want Christ to be the one that undoes himself. They want him to trip up and say the wrong thing in order that they would feel vindicated and no one would resent them for what Christ has done. Because if he did fall into this trap, if he did counter the law of Moses in some way, if he didn't uphold it, well, then they think we can get back control. People will stop listening to this man and start listening to us again. And people would stop following his teachings and come under our authority once more. So that's what they wanted when they asked Christ, what are you going to do about this? So Christ in his response, what does he do? Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. What did he write on the ground? And in preparation for this, I I, I listened to a few different sermons and and read a few different uh, commentaries on it. And I couldn't come to any conclusion. (laughs) No one really had an explicit answer on this. Some commentators suggest that he wrote down the words in verse 7 about if any of one of you is without sin let him cast the first stone there are some suggest that that's what he wrote others suggest that when he wrote on the ground he started to name a few of the sins that the pharisees were guilty of now that's just what others have said on this matter it may not be true but regardless of what he wrote It's important to take note of how he responds to the demands of the Pharisees because his response suggests a great deal about how Jesus responds to sin. And what we see is compassion. We see compassion on this woman who'd been so publicly humiliated in a horrible way. You see, the Pharisees being religious leaders But being men, mortal men, were sinners. And they were hypocrites. And Jesus was gradually, through this encounter and through his ministry, was revealing the fact that they were hypocrites. That they were just a sinner such as everybody else, needing salvation the same as everybody else. And he was revealing this over time. And of course, they took issue with this. So in turn, they used this woman embroiled in sin as a means of making an example and perhaps exerting a level of revenge on Christ. As Christ reveals their sin, they in turn try to out Christ. Because everything that these Pharisees do, it's all public. It's for everyone to see. They wait until the crowds are gathered together. And they take delight. They are pleased by putting somebody's sin on display for everyone to see and to make an example of them. That's how they respond to sin. They take this desire and this delight in revealing and exposing everybody else's sin in front of everybody in a very public and humiliating way. But Jesus does not. He does not respond in the same way. He doesn't play up to their public uh, display, this publicity stunt that they're trying to pull. When Jesus writes on the ground, the only people that can see that are those closest And that was the Pharisees who were closest to him. And so by doing so, he's discreet in his response. He's quite private in his response, as private as you can be in such a public setting. But Jesus does that out of a compassion and respect 
towards that woman who had been so publicly humiliated. So what is the significance to Christ's response compared to the religious leaders? Religious leaders see sin. Yes, they expose it, but they do so in a very degrading way. How does Christ differ when he uh, is confronted with sin? The Pharisees consider themselves the judge and enforcer. We know that. The extent to which they take this pleasure in punishing people that are guilty of breaking the law, that's concerning. They're happy to make other people's sins known and made public. They're pleased to deride someone and condemn them even to the point of death they have no issue with. But their greatest personal feeling is feeling to recognize and acknowledge the sin in their own lives. And unlike the Pharisees, Jesus does not deal with us harshly. He does not seek to deride us or humiliate us. He takes no pleasure in degrading us or making us feel worthless because of our sin. Instead, he deals with us graciously and mercifully. Christ shows compassion upon us, knowing that we're not capable of being free from sin on our own accord. Christ understands that sin makes up us. It's in our DNA. We're told in the scriptures from the moment of conception, we are sinners in God's eyes. We're a sinner condemned to hell. But Jesus does not laugh at us. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't publicly humiliate us. Instead, what does Christ do when confronted with our sin? Well, he gave of himself completely. He shed his blood on the cross. He was the one that was humiliated in order that we can be forgiven and therefore be free from sin. The reality is Jesus' response to sin could simply not be any more different or opposite than that of the Pharisees. And then we see here the Pharisees, they start to scurry away. They start to disappear. And how is it that they've become so convicted of their sin? Even though Jesus Christ hasn't verbalized anything, he hasn't spoken anything, he hasn't publicly derided them or humiliated them, but somehow they've become convicted of their sin. At least become guilty of something. You see, we don't hear Jesus, like I said, start to list off the Pharisee sins. But this is just further evidence of the compassion of Christ upon a sinner. Even though they were not subjected to public humiliation, having their sins made known to all, like this woman, they were not condemned. Now we don't know what they were convict- and how they were convicted of their sin. Some commentators say that Jesus started to write their sins on the ground, like I mentioned, and it was because of that that they started to retreat and leave. But ultimately, they didn't actually need Jesus to say anything in response to this. They didn't need Jesus to write anything in the ground. They knew the law of Moses better than anybody. And therefore, knowing that, They knew all the ways that they had broken that law. And consequently, they knew what they deserved according to the law. They knew that if they were judged, they too would be found guilty and deserving of a penalty, perhaps even death. If they were going to be held to the same account as they were expecting this woman to be held, they would have equally been guilty and equally condemned. So then we have, they've been challenged. Jesus Christ has not fallen into this trap. They have beginning to retreat, realizing that he's not falling for it. This plan is, is failing, it's falling apart. He clearly knows what he's talking about. So they begin to leave. 
And then we have just this encounter between Christ and this woman. And I want us to ask the question, what do we notice about Jesus' interaction with this woman in terms of condemnation and judgment? So no one's left, it's just them. Now even when on their own, Jesus and this woman, he doesn't start to berate her and challenge her and, and, and tell her what an awful person she is. Instead, he actually says to her, I do not condemn you. But it's not just that. It's that she should go and no longer continue in her sin. You see, what Christ offers in this moment is forgiveness. He's not saying, and please let me be clear on this, he's not saying that the sin is okay. He's not condoning her actions in any way. What he is saying is, I don't condemn you, I forgive you, but you must sin no more. So that's not Christ condoning sin. He's acknowledging her sin in front of her, but he commands her to sin no longer and he offers her forgiveness. See, he's not approving of it, but he acknowledges that the law of Moses, it's not that breaking of the law that makes her a sinner. It's not committing adultery that makes this woman a sinner. See, these are symptoms of a bigger problem. This woman, before any of this, is already a sinner. Before these things. And therefore, Christ forgives her and calls her to sin no more. And that is how Christ deals with us. When our sin, when we bring our sin to him, this is how he deals with us. He doesn't berate us over one particular sin. Instead, we are to simply acknowledge that in our natural state, we are a sinner. And yes, we could identify particular sins, of course we can, but in our natural state, we are an enemy of God, deprived and when we do this, when we acknowledge our sin before God, ask him for forgiveness, he embraces us. He cleanses us. He clothes us in righteousness and he puts in us a new clean heart. And as he commanded the woman to sin no more, so must we. That command is as much for us today as it was for her then. Having been forgiven of our sin, we are to sin no more. We are not to think of ourselves as having some license to sin. This is a free pass. Oh, Christ has forgiven me. I'm okay. I can continue to do what I want. We shouldn't find any contentment in sin or any peace in sin, thinking, well, Christ has forgiven me. It's all good. Instead, we should be continually acknowledging our sin before God and constantly asking his forgiveness for our sins on a daily basis. As we dwell on this earth, we will continue to sin. But as God's people who are forgiven in Christ, we don't sin in such a way that we are condemned to hell. Rather, we sin because we are broken and we're flawed. But in God's goodness... And in his mercy, we are presented before him holy and blameless in Christ because Christ took our place. He paid the price for our sin and he was humiliated for us. That is how we are treated. That is how God acknowledges our sin when we bring it to him and seek forgiveness. And in verse 12 there, it says... When he spoke again, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So what does Christ mean when he says the light of life? So this is one of three references where Jesus Christ refers to himself as light within John's gospel. So it's not just an isolated reference. We see it several times within John's gospel where Christ refers to himself as light. And this woman's sin of adultery, it wasn't the cause of anything. 
It wasn't an isolated problem. But like I said before, this was a symptom of a bigger problem. And that bigger problem is the sin of the world and the darkness that exists in this world. Now you can sit here and in your mind you can name as many people as you like that you will know live daily blind to the truth. Ignorant, totally ignorant to the things of God. Blinded by their own self-worth and their own self-love. You only have to take a few minutes onto any social media account and you can see people's love for self. You see, people are walking daily in a symbolic darkness. They know nothing of the light of Christ. They know nothing of the light of life. And when Christ uses this phrase here, his reference is symbolic of hope and of truth. What exists in the darkness? Lies and deceit. And these multiply and they fester and they grow. But what does light do? Light exposes these things. Therefore, Christ, as the light of the world, the light of life, his purpose is to eradicate the darkness, remove it completely, and expose the evil in this world. Now, for you and I, we may sit here and we, and we, we know Christ as Savior, and that's a glorious thing, but you may know others that don't. But it's only when we're convicted of our sin that can we repent of it. We need to be challenged of our sin. And then we can repent of it. And that's what Christ does for us. He shines his light into our lives, exposes the darkness, exposes and points out to us the sin and the darkness that is in our lives. And in doing so, he shows us the hope and the truth that exists within him, that we need in order to eradicate and remove that darkness. So what does that mean for us? Just in closing, for those of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, what does this encounter, what does this passage of scripture mean for us? It is expected that as followers of Jesus Christ, we too reflect this light and expose the sin around us. We are to expose the sin in the world around us. Our friends, our family, where we see sin, we are to make mention, we are to confront it. The difference is, we don't act as the Pharisees did. We don't publicly humiliate someone. We don't condemn them to death. But rather, we respond as Christ did. We expose sin out of compassion, out of a desire to help that person no longer continue to sin in that way. Therefore, if someone you know is a sinner outside of Jesus Christ, out of compassion, share Christ with them. Help them to see their need of a saviour. And if you know of a fellow brother or sister in Christ that is sinning in a way that you know and you know it's wrong and you know according to the scripture they shouldn't be doing it. You don't need to make a public spectacle of them. You don't need to humiliate them. But bring it to their attention. Do confront them with it. But do so in a gracious and a loving way. Help them to realize their sin and encourage them to bring that sin to God that they would seek forgiveness for it. You see, in all of this, as much as we are reminded and we can see how we're to treat sin in others and sin in the world around us, we're also reminded of our own sinful state and the fact that we all need a saviour and that none of us are judge. We do not have that authority. It's not for us to condemn. It's not for us to consider our sin any less of a sin compared to those around us. Sin is sin. Sin is rebellion against God, first and foremost, no matter who you are. So as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're encouraged to reflect 
Jesus Christ in our attitude and in our approach, both to our own sin and in the sin that we see in others. And I pray earnestly that through God's help, they would help us to do this. And so lastly, I just want to leave you with this question. How is it that I ought to deal with the sin in my life and in the life of others? And ultimately, the answer is simple. You bring your sin to Christ and you encourage others to do the same, but do so as Christ has done. And through God's help, we pray that he would do this for us. Amen.